you may have forgotten because so much time has transpired since um, I started talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Mm. And uh, God has been great to us. He's given us uh, guest speakers. Things have happened uh, along the way and, you know, Easter and so on and so forth. So it has uh, interrupted the flow of those uh, nine fruit of the Spirit. So I spoke about love and I spoke about joy. Uh, but here I am now. The third fruit of the Spirit is what? Peace. Peace. And I want to reflect a little bit on that. You know, that's such a profound topic. As I started reflecting on it, I realized, man, this will, this will take many weeks of uh, meditation on the peace of God and how peace should manifest itself through our lives. That it, it, it would take, but I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it. And I, who knows? I mean, next Sunday I may even continue with the topic because it is so deep and so uh, rich. But, yes, the, the Galatians chapter 5 speaks about that, 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay, and then it, adds, it speaks about forbearance, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, um, and all those wonderful, wonderful attributes of the Spirit-filled soul. So it is that third fruit of the Spirit that we should um, yearn for in our lives. We should seek ardently. Um, now let me read from Philippians chapter 4 regarding uh, that piece. And it'll, you'll get a sense of where I'm going here. Uh, you know, uh, in verse 4, chapter 4, Philippians, uh, Paul calls us to joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And here he enters into the, the meat of this thing. Do not be anxious about anything. And it, it is a gentle invitation to put aside, you know, stress and striving and, you know, fighting for, for things. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, I think already you begin to see something here, that the call to peace is not just a call to one particular kind of situation when things are going well, when things are peaceful. No, it says in every situation. That means that there's going to be times of stress, difficulty, trial, scarcity, you know, all the things that rankle us and, and uh, uh, put us in stress. But in every situation, by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Invitation there to think about prayer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. And, you know, as a result of that, verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. That means which is beyond anything that you can explain or understand. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then there's another piece to that uh, here. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, and this is connected to peace, by the way, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. It is an invitation to us to... Focus actively on these beautiful things, these lovely things that are so appropriate to God's kingdom. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. I, I could say there, just as an aside, that one of the things that we should focus on is the example of godly people. And uh, our relationship with people who are more mature and more advanced in their spiritual work than we are. Because I think that, it, that can be a source of peace as well. As we draw near to people who are gentle and kind and wonderful and mature, you know, that, that also has a, a, an imparting effect on us as well. And it's a contagious thing. So seek people of peace. Seek people who reflect the beauty of God's kingdom. Uh, because they, they have a way of, uh, you know, contagion. A way of... Um, touching you with their energy as well. So that's just an aside. It's not there necessarily, but I think that that's, that's, that's the idea here. We need to see good examples. That's one of the things that makes us and allows us to be at peace. It says, put it into practice. 
And then the conclusion, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, all those things that he has uh, spoken about earlier, you know, prayer and, and let your gentleness be evident to all, all of these things will uh, result in the God of peace will be with you. And I'll have something to say about the nature of God and his peaceful nature. God is a God of peace. And uh, it is, it's a one quality that is, that is associated with God. Not necessarily just his power, his justice, his holiness, but the peace that comes from being close to him as well. Um, there's another uh, piece to this uh, passage here. Um, verse 10, which I want us to think about as well. Paul continues to write to the Philippians and he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at least, that at last you renewed your concern for me, etc. And then in verse, verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. You could almost add a piece. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Man, I wish I could say that. Uh, I'm, I'm aiming for that. But I cannot say that I've, I've, I've attained that. No? I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to, be, to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now, you will discover later on in another passage that, you know, it's not as easy as Paul makes it sound. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting because he has his moments as well. Being content in any and every situa situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Amen. You know, uh, the, the peace of God is not uh, dependent on me concocting it. It also depends on, you know, God himself uh, bringing me into that peace and God giving me the strength to stand firm on the. Meche, can you pass me the water, please? Thank you. Um, now, James 3 is interesting also. Um, thanks. James 3 is interesting as well um, because it gives us a little insight about peace and, and warfare, internal warfare, and how the unreconciled things within us can bring us into a state of concern and anxiety. It says, who is wise in understanding among you? Let them show by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. You know, I think James here in his pastoral way, and by the way, in his, his direct Jewish way, when he speaks, he speaks directly. I mean, Jewish people are known to be like that. You know, they're in your face. They, they say things clearly. Nowadays, we want pastors to speak to us very gently and nicely all the time and so on. Paul, uh, James was a direct Jewish cultural person who spoke, you know, without ambiguity. Um, so do not boast about or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly and spiritual demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. What I, what I was going to say is also that, um, you know, when he uses the word wisdom, I think he's speaking about intellect and knowledge and so on. There's a kind of intellect, secular intellect, often not grounded in God, in the love of God, in the word of God, that often leads to discord and uh, tension and competition, strife, division, controversies. And he says, you know, that's not the wisdom from heaven because that only fosters disorder and every evil thing. Think about America today and how there's so much discord and so on. How much wisdom from any side, from all sides, and everybody's distorted and, and, and discord and divided. And there's all kinds of things going back and forth. I'll say a little bit about that later on. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven, the wisdom of God, is first of all pure. Then peace-loving, considerate, submissive. We don't like the word submissive. It smacks of, um, you know, being wimpy and letting people walk over us. But the Bible speaks about submit to one another. Submission is a beautiful thing, by the way. When you learn to submit to authority, when you learn to submit to others, 
when you learn to submit to the goodness in somebody else who can be an example to you to grow more in, the, in that direction, and you submit to the truth in them, that's a beautiful thing. It's good to submit to authority, by the way, young people, whatever, you know. It's good to submit to parents. It's good to submit to authority. There's something beautiful about submission uh, that is, you know, not, uh, again, not uh, sort of psychologically sick or defective. No, submission that is an act of the will that comes from knowledge of how good it is to submit to authority. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That is the wisdom that is convenient to the kingdom of God. That is the wisdom that I would want in my life and that I want to strive toward. Not the wisdom that sees fault. Not the wisdom that sees, um, you know, defect. Not the wisdom that sees the wrong that is in the person. But uh, the wisdom that seeks the best from them. That eye that you have. The Bible says that if your eye is uh, evil, everything that you see will be evil. You see, when you have, when you have strife inside of you, when you have division inside of you, when you have criticism inside of you, everything that you look at will remind you of that. Because the world is full of sin, and all of us are sinful. And so if your attitude, your inclination is to see the evil, you will see it everywhere. If you yourself are not healed, everything that you see around you will remind you of the evil that is in the world. When you are healed, and when you have the goodness of God in you, it will give you a lens that will see the defect, but will allow you to go beyond it and to see the goodness, the potential goodness in someone. You will not only see the defect, you will also see the greatness and the potential, and you will be oriented to that. Healed people see healing in the world, whether in potential or in actuality. That's something beautiful. And those people are people of peace. And they, they inspire peace in environments and in individuals. That, this is why he says in verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's a profound yeah. verse, and I don't have time to, um, to really, you know, explore it. But it's a wonderful passage. Read about it. You know, ask yourself, Father, what is the wisdom that comes through me? What is the intellect that uh, animates my critical examination of the world is it one that is wholesome that is like you like jesus peace inducing or is it one that sees the defect and that sees the fault and that dwells on it important thing this is the wisdom of god the wisdom of heaven and um you know i i there's several passages and who knows even maybe the passages will will serve for your meditation so even if i don't uh, succeed in completing the whole meditation. I am taking little stabs at it even before I begin the substance. Um, <clears throat> there's another passage. I, took, I chose 2 Corinthians 11 for, the, for certain reasons, to show you the complexity of peace. Okay, and, and uh, this Paul who says, do not be anxious about anything, he himself admits that many times he is anxious about things. So he's talking about his many sufferings in ministry. And 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, he says, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Man, I'm exhausted just to hear all the stuff that he's suffering from, right? <laughs> but then he says, and besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Other translations will speak about the concern, the, the, the anxiety that I feel, angustia, the anguish that I feel. The pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? That, that's the pastoral heart in Paul speaking. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? That means, you know, I am angry or I don't know what it is. So I'm anxious for that, the well-being of that person who is being led into sin by somebody else or by some action or critique. You know, and he inwardly burns. So, you know, Paul is not this placid guy. I would have been surprised. If, uh, you know, he hadn't, because Paul is a very honest man, and he admits many times, you know, he suffers from all the inconveniences and weaknesses that we all do. But he's calling us to a higher goal. And, you know, you need to maintain that higher goal. You will not always be able to stay at peace or joyful or whatever. But you must strive for that, even as you acknowledge that many times you don't, you don't quite get there. 
right? And then there's this interesting passage, which I just want to leave again for your meditation. James chapter 4, 11 and following, about how your inward state often leads to outward discord. There's a lot of uh, divided people in America and in, in the churches sitting in our pews. There's a lot of people who are immature spiritually and emotionally. There's a lot of people who have not resolved uh, their inner facets. There's a lot of people inwardly divided, schizophrenic. They are full of different strivings that they have not sort of come, brought together into harmony and into coherence. A lot of us suffer from that. And what James is saying that often, you know, that, that these unresolved issues within ourselves, they cause division outside. And, and so we need to first heal ourselves of all those divisions. So sometimes we say, Lord, give me your peace. Well, yes, but God doesn't sort of open the skull and uh, with a little, you know, scalpel or something uh, infuse peace as some sort of magical essence. No, I mean, peace is the result of many things coming together. And it's a long process that we should strive toward. So he's saying here that often discord will come from unresolved issues within ourselves. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? We have to ask for the peace of God to invade and to massage all the different yearnings, all the things that are unresolved, that have not been brought to the right state. You desire, but do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That's an indictment there. But, you know, there's this idea <clears throat> that uh, we need to examine ourselves in the light of the Spirit and ask the Lord to help us to, to bring peace to our own inner self. We should examine our thoughts, our yearnings, uh, how, how, how attachment, yearning for things, grasping for things, fighting for things, thinking that things are all powerful and all important, this leads to <clears throat> division as well. And uh, our own unresolved issues within ourselves. So you can see, I hope that by reading these different passages, I'm showing you how, how complex a phenomenon this peace of God is. It's a dynamic thing. It has many facets. Now, one thing is clear that God is a God of peace. In, in, in God, there's no conflict. In God, everything is harmonious. Even the Trinity, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they inhabit together in a wonderful, reconciled sort of way. God is a God of peace. The God of peace will be with you. He's associated in the Bible with the concept of peace, as in Philippians 4. Think of peace, the word shalom. Shalom in the Bible speaks of that unique peace that only God can give to his people. When the Jews said shalom to each other, it, it meant peace, but that peace which is so, it, it's a, an attribute that has many different things in it. Uh, not just the absence of conflict. God himself is a source of peace for us. His very presence, his nearness imparts peace to us. This is why Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. In other words, uh, as we focus on God, and that's the thing, the world will always distract us. They will take away our focus on God. It will, it will um, dilute, diminish our sense of the presence of God. And we need to th just bring our mind back to God. I mean, this will have to be done thousands of times possibly during the day. Because everything that we do is calculated in the world to take our, our focus from this God who has loved us, has promised to be with us, is powerful enough to sustain us, has purposes for us, and so on. But the uh, events of life and, you know, the fleeting thoughts, they take away our thought from God. And the Bible says if you keep your mind on this God, if you, if you bring your sensibility back to him, that will induce peace in you. So one of the things that we need to do is, you know, keep our minds focused on God. Let your whole day be a meditation upon the things of God. If we are completely, if we were able to completely focus on God and not so much on our problems or the threats around us, 
the scriptures tell us that we can have that perfect peace. The problem is, as I say, that often we cannot do that. You know, problems have a way of focusing us on them, on the problems, as opposed to the promise, the presence. And that's why we have to say, Lord, let me not look so much at the problem and the challenge. Let me focus more on you and your good purposes in my, in my life. And as we have seen, one of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. That means that, that if the Spirit of the Lord is in us, in an individual or place, there will be peace there because the fruit of that intimacy with God will be peace. We won't have to produce it, just like love or joy. I said before that, you know, it's just the fruit of the Spirit is because our intimacy with Him, our connectedness with God allows us to then produce this fruit of peace and so on. Um, another thing is this, you know, that, that, as Paul reminds us, they, they will not al- we will not always be at peace. There will be moments. So don't feel guilty at this call of the apostle to do not be anxious about anything. That's an impossibility for human beings. You know, we, w- we will never always dwell in the peace that God is calling to. But I, I do say this, though, that the, the default state of a Christian should be some measure of peace. Uh, the opposite, a Christian that is in turmoil all the time and anxiety, we need to check our spiritual state. You know, something is wrong somewhere. It may not be me. I may not be guilty, so to speak. But there's something. Because I think that the Bible does call us to dwell in a state of peace, contentment. Um, and, and uh, you know, that should be the place that we depart from and come back to. Now, there will be moments when you'll be out there in the world and there will be hustle and bustle and demands and so on and so forth, but always return to the castle. Strengthen yourself, replenish yourself, replenish your sense of the goodness of God and His presence, and then, you know, God, life will bring you out, and for a while you will be, but you've got to return to it. Don't, the default posture should be peace and contentment and, and the clarity about the goodness of God. The closer we are to the Spirit of God, the more focused we stay on the things of God, most probably the greater the peace that we will experience. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it a little bit more uh, in a minute if I get to it. Um, you know, again, let me clarify. There, there, there are periods of such stress and difficulty in our lives that no matter how hard we try or how much we pray, we may have difficulty finding that peace that the Bible writes about. And the reason why I, I made that note is because I don't want to add guilt to people who are dealing with stress and and anxiety. You know, I, I've known people, believe me, who, man, no matter, no matter what good platitudes and, and good advice you tell them, they are fighting with something that is sometimes beyond their control. It's not, I've, I've, lear- I've known people who are extraordinarily spiritual and they still fight with anxiety. They still are dealing with anxiety. Anxiety is as physical a thing as anything else at times. You know, it can be a, a hormonal thing. It can be a... Um, a chemical imbalance. It can be something that has been initiated by a period of great trial and trauma. And then I tell you this, when your nervous system gets out of whack, it's so hard to bring it back into wholeness. And no matter how much you stress and try and pray and rebuke and read and declare, man, that, that thing still stays there. Many great men and women of God over, over history have talk, I've talked about that. You know, so I, I don't want to heap more guilt on people by, by telling them, hey, you're dealing with anxiety and, and uh, you know, you've, you've had that problem for a long time. It happens, people. And I wish I could be here saying, no, no, you're spiritual. You're, no, it does happen. So I wanted to clarify that. This is a very dynamic, complex thing. But the Bible does have some advice for us in the process as well. I don't know all the mysteries of the neurology of the, of the human mind. And the, 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 but there is a call, and I think there is a possibility of dwelling in peace. And, and there are elements of anxiety that are manageable and they can be remedied. They can be worked on. And the scripture offers a lot to that. But don't add more guilt to yourself just because you, you're not there yet. Go one step at a time and just rely on the goodness and the blessing of God. Amen. You know, there, there are sincere Christians who have experienced, again, uh, trauma and uh, Long periods of uh, anxiety, you know, I have, I have dealt with that my own self. This is why I think I understand about this element, that it's so important to uh, be, be, be gentle with ourselves. 
about this call to peace because sometimes uh, I hear people pe speaking about peace and so on and they end up leaving people more anxious than they were before they heard the sermon. So we got to be careful about that. Okay? So I, as I've said, the, the, the peace of God is a very complex thing. It, it's, here's an interesting reflection on that as well. Uh, when I, when, uh, these three elements, these first three elements, uh, love, joy, and peace, they have one thing in common, which is that uh, they, they are not dependent, dependent on just circumstances or inner feelings. Love, we have said, that is not something you, you necessarily have to feel to somebody, towards somebody. You may not feel love um, for, toward your, your mate or to the crying child, um, but, you know, you still love them. Love is something that you choose. No, love is an action, it has been said. Love is a verb. So it's not dependent on just the circumstance or emotion. Joy is the same thing as well. We have said that joy can be experienced in the midst of trials and suffering because joy, the joy of the Lord is not gladness. It's not just happy, happy, you know. It's not superficial. The joy of the Lord is a profound thing that depends on many things, and we have talked about that as well. I won't belabor that point either. So love is, is independent of circumstances, to a degree, and emotions. Joy as well. And the same thing about peace as well, that, you know, it's not dependent on just uh, peaceful circumstances. You can experience uh, the, 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 the incomprehensible peace of God. And that's why Paul says, and the love, the love of God that passes all understanding will be with you. Jesus says, mi pasos dejo, mi pasos doy. My peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it as the world gives it. You know, there's a different kind of peace that Jesus gives, and we should be mindful of that as we ask the Lord for that peace. So these three qualities are not dependent on just, you know, circumstance. They're not easy, simple, simplistic qualities. They come from almost an ethical, spiritual uh, embrace of these things and, and on, on the goodness of God and on dwelling on God and, and being injected with this beautiful attributes of the Spirit itself. It, it is the Spirit that is doing the, that in you. My favorite illustration of peace is uh, the, peace of, uh, the, the peace of God is the image of Jesus. Fast asleep on the boat. With, other, with the other disciples, surrounded by a violent storm. The, all the disciples are in panic, but Jesus is in perfect peace, snoring away at somewhere in the boat and just relaxed. And, you know, he's happy. Maybe he was thinking, he was speaking to angels at that moment or whatever. But, you know, there's a storm raging around him. I've said that there was no, that in the universe, the history of the universe, there has never been a more peaceful uh, protected place than that boat with Jesus in it because it could not fail. It could not sink because it had the Son of God in it. That was the safest place in the entire universe, that moment, that, that place there. And, and um, you know, Jesus knew, I am the Son of God. I know who I am. I'm grounded in God. This ship will not fail. It will not sink. We need to know. I, I hope that the Lord will just infuse in me more and more this sense of, I am a child of God. I, I know the purpose that he has for my life. I cannot, my life will not sink. It will not end in despair, destruction, failure, because my God loves me, and he has good purposes for me. Amen. Jeremiah 29, for I know the thoughts that I have for you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you the end that you desire. That always grounds me. When I feel most insecure about my future, I say, Lord, I know that you, you have not created me. You have not designed me for failure. You will bring some good things out of whatever it is that I am experiencing. So um, let me summarize here at this point. I've said, number one, peace is not the absence of conflict. It depends on the presence of the Spirit of God within it. Number two, the peace of God does not depend on peaceful circumstances. Number three, as followers of Jesus... We have the right to experience peace as a normative experience. Because God has a, it's, an, it's our inheritance. It, it is something that we have a right to aspire to. It should be the default posture of me because this is what God has designed me for. So these are, these are things that are important. Um, let me just speed up here. Uh, 
Here's a couple of other principles that would be good for us to keep in mind about the peace of God. Here's uh, number one. Uh, we, we ha- in order to experience the peace of God, we have, uh, we have to have the right priorities. And we have to keep the right perspective on what, what things are important, what things are essential in life. There are needs and there are, we've heard that, wants. They're not the same thing. And we must learn to differentiate between the two. And that, that is a call to simplicity. I think when we learn to live simply and to know what, what is important, you know, uh, it, it, it can bring us to a certain peace. When we are striving, I want that Mercedes. I want that BMW bad. I want that house with four bedrooms in, you know, in the best neighborhood in, in, in Boston. You know, there are people like that. They're, they're so attached to things or, or whatever, whatever it is, you know. Um, it, it is, it, the more attached you are to material things and to, you know, the things of the world, probably the more anxious you will be. When you divest yourself of uh, this attachment to material things, you know, this, this talk about inflation, it has all of us anxious these days. Inflation at 8% or 10% or whatever, you know. And, you know, I, I, I've learned that, you know, I can reheat some of the food that I, I ate yesterday. At my house, by the way, we don't waste food. We eat and we reheat food all the time. And every time I see myself, myself heating up some rice and beans and, and some meat, I'm saying I'm fighting inflation. You know, because a lot of people, they're just throwing away food left and right. No wonder they're concerned about inflation. You know, learn to enjoy, you know, simple food. Uh, with me, you take a plantain and, and you know, we boil it and, and a fried egg and I'm in heaven. Uh, you know, if it comes to that, then that, that's okay. You know, I can be content with that. We have to learn to, um, you know, simplify our lives. And, you know, all I need is a place to sit on. It doesn't have to be a throne. It doesn't have to be a beautiful, you know, something from a big name company. Uh, we, we have to learn as long as a place is clean and neat, you know, I'm fine. You need two pieces of clothes. You know, how, how many things we have in that closet, man? We're, we're complaining about, about inflation, but we're buying like crazy. Yeah. You know, use some of the things that you have in there. Re- rescue them. That, this, is what, this is what brings peace, you know, simplicity. Not, not being attached to so many things. You know, Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, But godly, godliness with contentment is great gain. There's a lot of people who are very godly, but they are anxious as, as crazy. You know, it, it's, it, they're very anxious because um, they, they haven't learned that the piety of God brings also you bring, bring peace. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, let us be content with that. Amen. Hey, there, there's a recipe for peace. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and the trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Make a note of that chapter in 1 Timothy 6 and talk about it for, and, and think about it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man, woman of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. That, that's, the fruit, that's another list that constitutes the fruit of the Spirit right there. Amen. Where are your priorities? What are you attached to? What gives you happiness and joy? If you lost all the pl- toys, could you still be happy? What is important in life? I think we should give ourselves some therapy about that and learn to be content with just the simple things of life. As we learn to put our priorities and to value especially the things of the Spirit, as uh, Paul says here, and the development of our spiritual life, we will give less importance to material things and to the concerns of this world. And therefore, we will be able to more easily experience the peace of God in the midst of difficult circumstances. Detachment, as the Buddha would say, I had to quote him, <laughs> is, the, you know, is the way to... Illumination to enlightenment to peace of God. Yeah, we have to detach ourselves from, from many things and uh, yield them to God. So, you know, get your priorities straight and, 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 and the things that you really, that are important in your life. Number two, I think that knowing that those who are in God's will, all things will ultimately work out for good. Even those things that at the moment don't seem very positive. This is a thing that has almost become a cliche. To all who love God, all things work out for good. But it's, it's in the Bible. 
It's in the Bible. It's a, it's a, it, it is a cliche because it's so good that people continually say it. For me, knowing that, you know, um, all the things that happened in my life, that uh, fender bender that I experienced that, that morning or, or, you know, whatever it is that, <laughs> I won't say it, but, you know, whatever it is um, <laughs> that fell on your head or on your car this morning, you know, um, it all, you know, there's a cosmic balance that is always being established and you're part of that equation. Somehow, if you love the Lord, if you're in the Lord, if Jesus is your master, you know, everything that works in your life, the, at the end of the day, the balance will be for your blessing. And you got to believe that. Uh, so that when, when things happen that don't go your way, think that somehow God will work it out. Maybe not in the moment. And even if, it, if that doesn't bless you as fully as it should, at least try to ingest as much as you can of that truth. And it will add a little element of uh, blessing. When we are experiencing difficulties, we must give God time to work out His perfect will in our lives and through our circumstances. We must exercise faith as we wait for the complete unfolding of God's mysterious work in our lives. As we learn these lessons and having the right perspective, we won't fall into despair or anxiety so easily. When you're going through difficulties, specific difficulties, remember that if you give God time, you may discover that what seemed a, a total mess actually turns out to be a blessing in disguise. That with proper time, you will see that plane that you lost, that, that, you, know, that, 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 that you missed uh, when you went to the airport may end up falling from the sky. And you know, you're going to be very happy that you didn't <laughs> climb on it, right? <laughs> I've had experiences like that long to tell, and I don't have the time. But, you know, things that really burned me. And then uh, t two minutes later, I found out what good could come out of it. I was saying, Lord, please make sure that that happens. When before I was trying to avoid it like crazy. You know, so God, it's like that many times. You know, we, things happen in our lives and they seem to be absolute tragedies. And later on we discover, no, they're for your good. Man, that is one of the greatest truths of the Christian life. And when you're going through the moment, you should exercise that kind of lucidity at that moment. And say, let me wait, Lord for you to unfold because I am in your goodwill and, um, and you may have a plan for that. That's important. Another, another thing that we should keep in mind here and I'll, I'll stop here and I think I will continue because there's a lot of stuff that, you know, uh, the, the thing that I discovered in thinking about this topic is that, uh, you know, we talk about peace, uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit as just being something uh, uh, like an internal thing, my peace. But you know, there's also, I, this weekend, a couple of things happened that show me that, um, you know, environments also can be considered when thinking about the peace of God and, and groups. There's a lot of stuff that happens in churches because, you know, a lot of division, a lot of strife. And uh, sometimes when we work together for an activity or something like that, there's strife that happens, conflict. You know, leaders end up fighting with each other and all kinds of stuff. And, and there's a reason why there's that division in that. So, you know... Uh, Environments also need the peace of God. And I, want to, I think I need to speak a little bit about that because depending on, on who, who we are, you know, we will be agents of peace or agents of discord, even in our own churches, in our own families. So peace is important, not just because I want peace for myself, you see. I've, until now I'm speaking of peace as a subjective experience. But there's also a peace of God that is reflected in environments that we need to talk about. The church, the church should be a place of peace. The church, and there's no peace in the church these days. Well, there is to some degree. But, uh, you know, we should never be content with a divided church, with divided leadership, where, where they're striving because the Holy Spirit is quenched and uh, grieved when there is discord in the church. Yeah. And it doesn't reflect that peace of God, that fruit of the Spirit. So, you know, for the moment, I, I ask you to think about that. So, you know, I'll stop here. I'll continue then next week uh, on that so you know just to summarize peace is a complicated thing peace comes from the intimacy with the spirit of God peace doesn't depend on circumstances peace comes from acquiring and cultivating a proper perspective peace comes from being content with the simple things of life and detaching yourself from striving about material things about success about what people think of you and so on and so forth 
Um, peace uh, comes from having godly relationships with people who are better or more mature than you and letting them impart their maturity to you as well and from submitting yourself to others as well, being humble, being gentle, being submissive in the right spirit of God. So these, these are things that I pray that the Lord will infuse in me this morning. Let's pray for a moment. Father, you are the one who um, gives peace. You are the one who gives joy. And uh, this morning, even in, uh, as we consider how complex an assignment it is to experience the peace of God, I pray, that, I pray that those who have come to this morning here and who may be feeling some level of anxiety or inner division, that we will experience somehow the, the, the touch of your spirit this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, help us to be a people of peace. Lead us through a journey. Lead us through a journey, a spiritual journey of growth and discipline and, and treatment on the part of your spirit that will make us people that are like those stones smoothed by the water that has been flowing over them for years and years and years. I want to be a person of peace, Father, for my own sake and for the sake of those that I work with as well. And may, may this congregation be a place of peace, a place of refuge, that when people come here divided and stressed and lacking the things that they need, that they may experience a supernatural sense of your peace here. We want that. We need that, Father. Let the peace of Christ reign over our lives, over our families. Lord, bless our families. Bless couples that are divided and in tension. Bless mothers outside this church who are uncertain. Single moms, for example, young moms or youth that are uncertain about their future as well and are anxious about what they're going to do in life. May the peace of God, may the shalom of God, of Christ, hover over this city. We declare that this morning, Father. Let this church irradiate peace. Let the prayers that are offered here, let the worship that takes place here be a source of blessing to this city. Thank you for having us in this city. We bless it, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your good purposes for us. Thank you for your patience with us, Father. You are so compassionate, so forgiving, so patient. I want to just rest my head in your bosom this morning, Father. Hear your steady heart beating for my, my well-being. Lead us from here in peace. In Jesus' name, amen.